Hey there everyone, hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Holy Shed on the road, as you might be able to see from behind me. And yeah, I'm not even disguising it this time. I thought, really, I thought I'd give you a few different books to check out for the little bits when you're bored. You know, you can always sort of see what books I've got here on my shelves in London, because that's where we are, where I had... This morning, the delight and honour of preaching to a live congregation once again at St. Leonard's Church in Streatham. And uh, many thanks to our lovely rector and very dear friend, Anna. What an amazing job she is doing. And it was particular fun today because one of the readings was the story in the New Testament, in the Book of Acts, about the so-called conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And, uh, you know, it's often overlooked that eunuchs are really part of a sexual minority, prejudiced against in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, where it says that they are barred from the assembly of the Lord. Uh, well, as you might imagine, I had a few things to say about that. So uh, if you're interested, you can take a listen to the sermon and uh, see what I had to say. But certainly it was what you might call a rainbow sermon. And afterwards, outside, I was talking to two women who are getting married this summer and would like nothing more than to get married in the parish church, as indeed the rector would love to marry them. But that's not possible, as you probably knew. No, not in the Church of England. Other churches uh, may well be places where you could get married, but not in the Church of England. And if that's something that bothers you, and you know, if it doesn't, see me afterwards. Uh, if that bothers you, then one little thing you can do is sign a declaration that uh, is going to be contained in a little film that I'm showing you at the end of today's Holy Shed uh, about affirming the dignity of all people. So you might want to take a look at that, and I certainly hope that you will sign up straight away, as indeed I have. And uh, we're going to begin today, anyway, with uh, a candle lighting moment. And let's light a candle for everyone who feels marginalised or discriminated against or left out for whatever reasons. Maybe you know someone like that. I'm sure you do. Uh, Maybe you feel that way yourself. So whether it's for yourself or for other people, I'm inviting you now to light a candle, a candle of hope, but also a candle of defiance and determination that things have to change. They must change in the world and in the church as well. So uh, get your candle out and let's light it now. Take a few moments. And let's join together in the words of our Holy Shed Serenity Prayer. God grant me the serenity to live fully and generously through circumstances I cannot control. Hope to keep on imagining better times for myself and the world. And courage to change what I can instead of simply leaving it to others. Amen. I'm going to begin right now with a a very short snippet of film of a woman called Joanna Macy. She appeared briefly in a film that I showed you last week, actually. Um, She's, I think, she's in her 90s now, an amazing woman. She's a a Buddhist teacher, um, but also uh, a magnificent environmentalist. And um, she's, she's really, you know, for years now, been at the forefront of this whole business of trying to press forward a change of consciousness about our relationship to the earth. So this is a a, a few words that she's saying. Have Have a listen to this. The life in us is so big, it cannot be reduced to one social role, to one curriculum vitae, that our roots go back, back, back to the beginnings of life. You know that, to the first splitting and spinning of the stars. And all of that journey forward Our human journey and those before us have brought us to this point. And we can be so grateful. I am so grateful to be alive now. Because for life to continue, 
Well, that means, and you know it in your heart, and that's why you're here at Bioneers, and that's why Kenny and Nina are so faithful in bringing it, that we have to make a giant step in our consciousness. We have to make real what we dream and know and intuit, that we are one planet people, and we can only be one planet people if we honor all our differences, that we belong to one living sacred body of Earth. Ah, you know, I love that woman. I love uh, her spirit. I love the content of what she has to say. And, uh, and I think that kind of nicely sets the scene for what I want to say now, which is really a continuity of things that we were talking about last week when I was, uh, I was on about the, um, our relationship with nature and, and also about the climate crisis. And you may remember that I said that apart from the massive and urgent changes of policy that are needed at the level of global politics, business and industry and so on, we also need a grassroots shift of consciousness if we are going to successfully find a way through the crisis, which is already unfolding all around us. It's no longer something that might happen. It, it's happening now. Uh, and you don't have to be terribly clever to see that. I mean, basically, uh, not to put it too kind of uh, too fine a point on it, we are buggering up our home here. And if we don't find different ways to live, like yesterday, our home isn't going to be uh, feeling very much like home uh, in the future for us and for lots and lots of our fellow creatures on Earth. And, you know, I don't need to rant on about the fact that things are already changing for the worse. I mean, you know, melting ice caps, um, increasing fires raging and, and floods everywhere, huge extinction of species, polluted oceans, and so on, and so on, and so on. I mean, it's happening everywhere. However, the shift of consciousness that I'm on about isn't just a matter of pragmatics or survival, goodness knows, that's pretty important. <laughs> but, it's, but it's about rediscovering who we are. It's, this is not a, just a journey on the outside world. I think that what the climate crisis is pressing upon us is the need for an inner journey. It's a journey about rediscovering who we are, connecting with our humanity, finding our creatureliness. We're earthlings, as I said last week, we're earthlings, but somehow we seem to have forgotten this. And in the process, we have massively depleted our quality of life as creatures on this earth. Now, I'm not an environmental scientist. I, I'm deeply concerned about it. I worked for a little while as the Bishop of London's, London's chaplain for the envir environment, it's all very important to me, but as I say, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. Uh, there are plenty of people who are offering that to us, but I am a spiritual guide. So quality of life, well, it's absolutely right up my alley. You see, the inescapable but sometimes inconvenient truth about life on planet Earth is that we are all utterly, radically, inseparably interconnected with each other as people, but with every other part of this whole ecosphere. The American mystic and environmentalist John Muir puts it rather well when he says, you can't pick up, pick up any piece of this world, a stone, a twig or whatever, without finding that it's hitched to everything else in creation. You know, just beneath the surface where we can look at things as individuals, just beneath the surface, it's like the roots go out and they're all... Everything is connected to everything else, including us. We are, in fact, uh, bit part players. You know, we're just a tiny part of this ginormous, gloriously tangled web of life. And from a Christian perspective, I, I want to say that it's Christ, the cosmic Christ, embedded in the very depths of creation that unites everything, that holds everything together, as Paul puts it in Colossians. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, split a piece of wood and I'm there. 
lift a stone and you'll find me there. I, I love that statement, don't you? Split a piece of wood and I'm there. Lift a stone and you'll find me there. Nothing in the world is ultimately profane or secular or devoid of spirit or sacred worth. Christ's presence, presence runs through everything like, you know, Blackpool in a stick of rock. <laughs> well, he is the rock, isn't he? <laughs> now, you may recall a while back, I talked about the theologian Sally McFaig's proposal that we need new models of God, that the old models of patriarchy and monarchy are no longer helpful. They're very top down um, in a world that needs to find a different form of relationship that's much more kind of uh, interrelational, much more mutual. And so her proposal, as we talked about it, as I say a while back, was that she said we need to, to picture God as mother, lover and friend. And, and this is the bit I want to put on, focus on today, and to see the world, the entire universe actually, as God's body. And, uh, and she suggests that if we can do that, that, that is a shift of consciousness which would make a massive difference. So instead of thinking about God as a kind of distant patriarchal figure somewhere off in the sky, separate from creation, that we see God as the maternal living presence at the heart of everything, the soul or breath of the universe. Incidentally, for any who might worry about this kind of thing, I'm not a pantheist. I'm not advocating pantheism here. I'm actually a panentheist. I'm not saying everything is God. Uh, I'm saying that God is in everything and everything is in God. The way I put it when I've talked about it before is to say that uh, I think of God as being like the atmosphere that surrounds the earth, the very um, source of life for everything on this planet. Without the atmosphere, nothing would exist. And so we all exist in the atmosphere. Every time we breathe in, we're breathing in the atmosphere. Um, it's, it's vital to our very existence. Eucharistic theology, you know, in the church, holds that God is mediated through something material, through a tiny pinch of bread, a sip of wine. However, for me, this only makes sense if the entire universe is a sacrament, if the whole material world is potentially a sacrament, that God is present in and through every pinch of bread, not just in communion, uh, in and through every loaf. God is present in every sheaf of wheat, every plot of ground in which the wheat grows, every drop of rain falling from heaven, every cloud that you know forms in the sky god is in and through the whole lot this dear friends this and only this is the kind of god that i believe in the god who is inescapably present to all of us in everything the modern scientific outlook uh, stemming from the from the enlightenment period gave us a particular way of seeing the world with what you might call the objective or the distanced eye. So we look with a distant, distanced eye. For science and technology to flourish, it was absolutely necessary to see the world like this, as something separate to us, to be able to stand back and look at it over there. And as I said last time, there have been massive benefits to this way of looking at the world. But the distanced eye easily becomes an arrogant eye, the gaze of a superior who can manipulate and exploit the world, turning it into a resource for our will and purpose. So look, as I said last week, I am a child of the modern age. I can't deny that. I value objectivity. But I'm also a spiritual being who cannot flourish internally unless I also discover a loving eye for nature unless I sense my deep oneness, uh, interconnection with the natural world, find my earthness, really, if you like. And I think that we can, you know, discover this loving eye toward nature in the things that Jesus taught, especially when he says things like, consider the lilies of the field, consider the birds 
of the air. Consider, consider. Pay attention. It's about recognising the intrinsic worth and value of each part of nature. You know, he said that a sparrow doesn't fall from the sky without God being aware of that, without God caring about that. Um, it's about loving it in all its difference, in all its diversity, and, and more than that, in all its details, in itself, for itself. St Francis's Canticle to the Sun, which we used last week and we will again tonight, epitomises this loving eye in which sun, moon, earth and water and all the elements are celebrated as sisters and brothers. Um, not as things that we manipulate and uh, observe over there, but, but sisters and brothers, part of one family. Lots of nature writing is a genre that exemplifies what I'm calling the loving eye um, and its aim is to help us to pay attention. You know there are scientific writings and I love scientific writing. I've got lots of them here uh, surrounding me. Um, so a scientific view of nature is, is wonderful and important and we get it on the television in lots of ways. But there's also a whole strand, a whole genre of writing uh, and of filming which is focused more on nature-loving rather than nature-observing. And its aim is to draw us into a relationship with nature, to pay attention, to focus on, to revel in the detail of each and every little scrap of nature. Annie Dillard isn't just a nature writer, but her work uh, as a writer fits the bill that I'm talking about perfectly. For example, in her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which is her kind of classic book, wonderful, wonderful book, she talks there about a goldfish. And it sounds crazy, but she describes her beloved goldfish, who she calls Ellery. And I'd like to read to you what she says, but as I do that, hey, here's the beauty of goldfish. This Ellery, she says, this Ellery cost me 20 cents. He is deep red orange. He steers short distances, mainly with his slender red lateral fins. They seem to provide impetus for going backward, up or down. It took me a few days to discover his ventral fins. They are completely transparent and all but invisible dream fins. He also has a short anal fin and a tail that's deeply notched and perfectly transparent at the two tapered tips. He can extend his mouth so it looks like a length of pipe. He can shift the angle of his eyes in his head so he can look before and behind himself instead of simply to the side. His belly, what there is of it, is white ventrally and a patch of this white extends up his sides, the variegated ellery. When he opens his gill slits, he shows a thin crescent of silver where the flap overlapped as though all his brightness were sunburn. For this creature, as I said, I paid 20 cents. I'd never bought an animal before. It was very simple. I went to a store called Wet Pets. I handed the man a quarter and he handed me a knotted plastic bag bouncing with water in which a green plant floated and a goldfish swam. This fish, two bits worth, has a coiled gut a spine radiating fine bones, and a brain. Just before I sprinkle his food flakes into his bowl, I rap three times on the bowl's edge. Now he's conditioned and swims to the surface when I rap. And he has a heart. Do you know, the juxtaposition of 20 cents with the elaborateness, cleverness, and sheer glory of this tiny, enchanting smidge of nature she calls Ellery, I, I find it completely unnerving. And, uh, and I don't know how you can possibly miss why I've read this, because, you know, it kind of speaks for itself. Ellery actually became Annie Dillard's travelling companion. It's true. You know, some people take dogs with them. Annie, when she went on her lecture tours and her talks, she took Ellery with her. She even named him actually Ellery Channing. 
I think only Annie Dillard could do that to call a goldfish Ellery Channing, which is actually after um, a transcendental poet. And uh, I don't know. There's something, as I say, unnerving about the way she juxtaposes those things, 20 cents worth. Different to that, but in a similar vein, is this book here. Um, a rather wonderful book called The Wild Remedy, How Nature Mends Us, and it's by Emma Mitchell. It's a beautiful book. You can see from the drawings here, um, it's, it's a beautiful book um, with uh, what's well, wonderfully written, um, but it's also got gorgeous drawings as well as some photographs by the author. Emma is described as a popular naturalist, but she also actually is a scientist. She's got a Cambridge degree in zoology and, you know, she features on things like Country File. She's been on Women's Hour and other things uh, in the media. And uh, she suffered from depression for 25 years, a condition that uh, she says often plunges her into a dark, mired place. Um, but with fantastic wit and frankness the book demonstrates how nature constantly comes to Emma's rescue um, it's a book that's organized around the months of the year so it's like a diary but it's also for me like like a love letter to mother nature and, uh, and I just want to read you this little bit from the introduction to the book she says this is a book about what I see when I venture outside our cottage over the course of a year both on days when the effort needed to do so seems too much to surmount and when all is well and the sunshine and birdsong call to me. None of the sightings that I describe are terribly unusual. There are no close encounters with golden eagles and I don't make friends with a Scottish wildcat. Apart from a tiny orchid that I shinned up a hill to find, the species I write about in this book are relatively common and many can be seen in urban parks. I've written about how standing among a carpet of jewel-like autumn leaves, finding some newly emerged catkins or spotting a sparrow hawk skimming across stubble field can bring solace. As the novelist Alice Walker wrote, I understood at a very early age that in nature I felt everything I should feel in church, but never did. Wow, that's quite a final statement from Alice Walker, isn't it? I understood at a very early age that in nature I felt everything I should feel in church, but never did. It's really a wonderful book. I mean, great present for someone, but probably best as a present for yourself. It's really lovely. And how sad, really, that last statement by Alice Walker. How sad that... The church offers so little uh, of that soul sustenance that, that Walker and Emma Mitchell find in nature. I mean, personally, I don't think it's a competition between the two. And because um, anyway, I don't think the church can possibly ever compete with this great cathedral of nature all around us. Um, so if I was looking to church for what I find in nature, I think I would definitely be massively disappointed so uh, I strongly recommend the book but also uh, Simon Barnes wonderful little book how to be a bad bird watcher which as you know uh, was the inspiration for me write, writing how to be uh, a bad Christian and uh, this is also a book it says it's, it's subtitle is to the greater glory of life and this is also a wonderful kind of book of of guidance in paying attention to nature and um, although, again, you know, there's there's plenty of science in here. It's also very much the writing of a nature lover uh, who says, you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter when you look out of your window, whether you know that that's a goldfinch or a greenfinch or a chaffinch for you to enjoy it. Um, that's not really what's important. It's it's the sense of belonging. It's the sense of connection. Of course, there's also. Uh, that wonderful poet Mary Oliver, whose work I often play in the shed or, or read to you. And um, she also is, is such an amazing nature lover. Uh, her whole book is, her whole writings, her poetry is really sort of 
nature spirituality. And um, uh, toward the end of her life, she, she wrote a book. She's a great dog lover, too. And toward the end of her life, she wrote a book called Dog Songs. And uh, there's one piece, one poem I'd like to, to play to you called Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night. And this is Mary Oliver reading. Hello, people. I'm going to read one poem from my new book, Dog Songs. And it's called Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night. He puts his cheek against mine and makes small expressive sounds. And when I'm awake or awake enough, he turns upside down, his four paws in the air, and his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me, he says. Tell me again. Could there be a sweeter arrangement over and over? He gets to ask. I get to tell. Thank you. Marvellous. We too are, are great dog lovers. We don't have one at the moment, but um, I remember with our, our last dog, Woody, who we bought from Battersea Dogs Home for, I think we paid £70 for him, which <laughs> yeah, probably cost quite a bit more now through after the lockdown, but... Um, Woody, what, where he was the joy of our life. And so many times, you know, uh, just looking at this glorious individual, this, this dog so precious in himself, I, I marvel at the fact that he only cost 70 quid because, you know, to me, he was worth a fortune. The way that we fall in love with another person is by being with them, isn't it? By spending time with her or him, by listening to them, by paying attention. And it's no different really with nature. The way that we experience the consciousness shift that I'm talking about uh, right now, the way that we will discover our deep connection with the planet, which I think is so important in these days, is basically by giving time to nature. You don't need to be a botanist or an ornithologist. You don't need to be an expert on different species, as Simon Barnes made clear. It's, it's about sensing that ecstatic oneness that we have with nature once we kind of give some time to it. So I think my recommendation is take walks. What better way is there than that? Taking walks uh, in the countryside, sit among the trees, maybe take some photographs. I've told you before, that's a big part of mindfulness to me is taking photographs, whether it's with my iPhone or with a uh, phone with a bigger lens or whatever. But, but basically, it's a way of focusing, especially on details. I think it's the details. That's where we find this um, uniqueness of each and every bit of creation taking time to notice things and then we'll find i think that deep empathy with nature that lies within us often buried under tons of um, distraction to stuff that really doesn't matter there is within us a deep empathy with nature and i think that is what is vitally needed uh, alongside of all these huge ecological changes that are needed both are necessary if we're going to move forward in and through the, the present crisis that, that is going on. Okay, so lots of you commented on how much you like the St. Francis version of the, the, the version of St. Francis's Canticle to the Sun last week. So I'm going to play that again as a kind of prayer of thanksgiving before we uh, make a toast. So have your drinks handy because we're going to toast this lovely world once again tonight. Here's the canticle.
wonderful wonderful stuff so okay grab yourself a drink uh things may be different behind me but one thing remains the same i've got a drink handy so whatever you've got uh i invite you to pour it now i know there are some of you like a nice g and t and others maybe a glass of wine others maybe some orange juice or a cup of tea or whatever it doesn't matter but i invite you now to uh take your drink and join me in toasting this wonderful planet that is our home and of which we're deeply a part. Let's toast all the wonderful things that uh, surround us day by day that we mostly hardly notice. You can live in the middle of the city, but nature's there too. And um, we often just pass it by without even noticing its uh, it's constantly even coming up through the cracks isn't it in the flagstones or the concrete or whatever it's kind of as if nature's always kind of fighting back against the concrete and letting its glory shine through so hey here's to mother earth and all who are a part of her including us to life laheim Fantastic. Well, we've come to an end again. Thank you for joining me. And uh, do let me know what your thoughts are about the Holy Shed as we go forward. Obviously, the world's changing around about us. And, um, you know, uh, the Holy Shed is not going anywhere. Let me just say that. I know some of you send me these messages saying, please don't. The Holy Shed isn't going anywhere, but it might need to change. And if you've got any thoughts or ideas about that, please do let me know. So, uh I think there we are really you know have a great week go well be kind to yourselves be kind to other people uh, stay human there it is and i'm going to finish with uh, this little video which is called declaring the sanctity of life and the dignity of all and i hope with all my heart that you'll check out the link at the end and go there and sign up to it so uh, take care guys see you soon bye We come together as senior religious leaders, academics and lay leaders from around the world to affirm the sanctity of life and the dignity of all. We affirm that all human beings of all sexual orientations, gender expressions and gender identities are a precious part of creation and are part of the natural order. We affirm that we are all equal under God, whom many call the divine, and that we are all therefore equal to one another. We call for all to be treated equally under the law. We recognize with sadness that certain religious teachings have often, throughout the ages, caused and continue to cause deep pain and offense to those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex. We acknowledge with profound regret that some of our teachings have created and continue to create oppressive systems that fuel intolerance, perpetuate injustice, and result in violence. This has led and continues to lead to the rejection and alienation of many by their families, their religious groups, and their cultural communities. We ask for forgiveness from those whose lives have been damaged and destroyed on the pretext of religious teaching. We believe that love and compassion should be the basis of faith and that hatred can have no place in religion. We call on all nations to put an end to criminalization on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity for violence against LGBT individuals to be condemned and for justice to be done on their behalf. We call for all attempts to change, suppress or erase a person's sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression, commonly known as conversion therapy, to end and for these harmful practices to be banned. Finally, we call for an end to the perpetuation of prejudice and stigma and commit to work together 
to celebrate inclusivity and the extraordinary gift of our diversity. <laughs>